So it's a, it is a real honor to introduce Peter Orzag, who will be delivering the keynote address today at our policy forum. Peter is the CEO of financial advisory at Lazard, Freres & Company, LLC, and leads the firm's advisory businesses that serve companies and governments across the globe. He has served in a variety of influential economic policy roles, including as a senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors, a special assistant to President Clinton for economic policy, the director of the Congressional Budget Office, and the director of President Obama's Office of Management and Budget. Peter has written extensively on healthcare spending growth and social security reform. Most notably, he's, no, he's the author of a 2006 book with Peter Diamond titled Saving Social Security, A Balanced Approach. We're sorry that Peter could not join us today in person, but so pleased that he could still make the time to deliver the keynote speech virtually. And I will hand it over to Peter right now, and then I will um, ask him some questions in a, in a few moments after his remarks. So thank you, Peter, and let's welcome him to deliver today's keynote. Well, thank you very much. And again, I am uh, deeply sorry that I could not uh, be with you. I am uh, a huge fan of Seepers and, and I appreciate uh, the invitation and, and greetings to everyone. Um, I thought that this would be a good opportunity, if we could uh, start to put up the slides, a good opportunity to look back on Diamond Orzag uh, and what's changed since then, and also to uh, talk about the pathway forward, perhaps. Um, you know, the reason that Peter Diamond and I wrote uh, the book was that at the time, there was no uh, reform plan that restored actuarial balance within Social Security uh, in a what we would call traditional way. In other words, balancing some uh, things on the cost side and some things on the income side. Uh, and instead, the whole rage at the time was uh, some form of private accounts or a little less it, to, to, a, to a lesser degree, investing the trust fund in equity. So some sort of uh, equity premium play either routed through private accounts or not. But traditional plans that eschewed playing off of that uh, equity premium really didn't exist and that's what we wanted to do. So I guess uh, since then, just to kind of summarize things, uh, private accounts as part of social security, I think are uh, pretty much dead, but so are traditional reform plans. So I don't know exactly where that leaves us, but what I wanted to do is just take a quick look back at what's changed since 2005. Uh, and then again, uh, talk a little bit about the potential pathway forward and leave most of the time for, uh, for questions. So a few things. First, uh, since we wrote the, the book, uh, the actuarial balance within Social Security has deteriorated you know, pretty materially. We show on the left here the 2004 projection uh, as, uh, as, as it stood when, we, when Peter and I were writing uh, in the dotted line. And the darker line is what's actually uh, transpired and then what's projected to transpire. And I think you can see that, at least from a trust fund projection perspective, uh, things have turned out much worse than what was expected at the time. And on the right, we break down why that's occurred. And you can see it's a combination to date of both uh, lower income, that's the black line on the, on the bottom, and higher cost, which is the uh, kind of grayish line on the top, compared to what the actuaries at least were expecting circa 2004, 2005. Uh, to break that down a little bit more, um, we thought it might be useful to break the actuarial imbalance into two pieces. One, be, and starting from the, from the point at which uh, the Greenspan reforms were enacted, at which point there was a 75 year actuarial neutrality or, or balance that existed. A series of changes that occurred uh, basically up to when we did the book and then series of other changes since then. And at the bottom, you can see that uh, the actuarial balance around the time we were writing was about 1.9% of taxable payroll. It's now basically doubled to 3.6. Um, and to break the changes down a little bit, um, what this chart does is just follow the office of the chief, chief actuary in categorizing 
uh, the, the underlying drivers of that uh, expanded actuarial imbalance. And the things that are particularly notable are the changes in uh, economic assumptions, um, which really has to do with lower than expected productivity and wage and GDP growth and a variety of other factors, but that's um, quite significant. Um, obviously the change in the terminal year also matters. This is a somewhat artificial um, 75 year window. And so as you move through time with an income and cost imbalance in the 75th year, the 75 year imbalance uh, gets larger. So that's a, a second material change. And then there's a whole variety of other things, but I actually having been away from this topic for a few years was surprised to see, I'm sure everyone in the room who covers this or follows this more closely than I have been at least for uh, a few years, uh, probably already knew this, but I uh, frankly just was surprised by how much things had moved um, since uh, Peter and I had uh, co-authored that volume uh, in, a, in a negative way. Just to dig into that a little bit more, um, what's also interesting is that while uh, on, the, on the top bank here, we show what's happened to some of the key economic indicators, and they've obviously bounced around a fair amount, uh, when you look at the forward-looking projections, uh, not much has changed, and I know the fonts may be small, but basically uh, relative to 2004, the current estimates for productivity growth, real wage growth, to some degree uh, GDP growth, are basically in line with where they are, where they were. CPI growth assumptions, despite the current bout of inflation, have come down a bit, as has the uh, projected unemployment rate, and as has the real interest rate that's uh, applied to the trust fund assets. But in general, it's kind of striking that, uh, at least on the left side, with regard to kind of the real economic indicators, um, the estimated the estimates looking forward haven't moved that much and i think this may just underscore the underlying tendency of the actuarial assumptions to move pretty slowly even when things are bouncing around um, a lot in the meanwhile so the other thing that um peter diamond and i were sort of at, i don't want to say at the cutting edge of because there had been a bunch of economic uh there had been a bunch of studies already pointing it out but i think we were uh somewhat early to the observation involving uh, growing differentials in life expectancy and how that could affect our entitlement program. So this was part of the book. At the time, it was kind of novel. Since then, there's been a lot of uh, confirming evidence. But just to break this down a little bit on the left, you see uh, life expectancy at birth, um, the big drop uh, associated with COVID. Let me immediately say that doesn't mean as everyone in the room I'm sure understands already, but sometimes in the media it can get confusing. It doesn't mean that our own life expectancies uh, have declined that precipitously. Uh, it, this is not a cohort life expectancy calculation. It's a period life expectancy calculation. And uh, you know, again, the drop is really just associated with the excess mortality uh, associated with COVID, which I'll, I'll come back to in a moment. On the right is, I think, a somewhat more interesting take, which is uh, a demonstration of this growing um, gap in life expectancy, growing differential in life expectancy by lifetime income or by socioeconomic status. And again, there's been a whole variety of different uh, research that has occurred over the past 15 to 20 years demonstrating this general effect. There have been a few um, papers suggesting it has not been occurring, but the overwhelming bulk of the evidence highlights this growing gap in life expectancy by either lifetime income or socioeconomic status. Uh, this is shown at age 50, but at pretty much any age, you see this uh, increasing gap in life expectancy by SES. The part that's probably a little bit less appreciated is what that does to our major entitlement programs. So this is a... Uh, a set of charts from a National Academies study that I uh, co-chaired with Ron Lee. And what it does is it takes uh, the present value of uh, entitlement program benefits for uh, people born in different years in different lifetime income uh, quintiles. And what you see is that if you look uh, either for males or females at the 1930 birth cohort, uh, over 
overall entitlement programs, let's just focus on males for a second, were roughly neutral distributionally. So there's not much uh, difference across the quintiles, um, at least in aggregate uh, dollars, obviously as a percentage of income, uh, the conclusion would change somewhat in terms of the degree of progressivity, but it's either neutral to progressive with regard to the overall entitlement uh, program benefits. Um, as you move to the 1960 birth cohort and that growing gap in life expectancy occurs, uh, you see a much different picture in which the higher income individuals are receiving larger lifetime benefits in present value dollars than uh, lower income Americans. And again, that mostly just reflects the fact that uh, as life expectancy gaps widen, higher income people receive their benefits for a longer period of time relative to lower income people. And wherever you started from a distributional perspective, uh, the overall system becomes less progressive as a result. Um, the right side shows similar effects in terms of becoming less progressive, although the levels of progressivity are somewhat different uh, for females. So this is something that Peter and I had uh, highlighted a bit in our book, and we actually designed some features of Social Security to offset this, the impact of these changes. Um, if anything, I think, again, the case for uh, reflecting this differential in life expectancy across income and socioeconomic uh, status has grown stronger since uh, 2004, 2005. The other thing that was noteworthy in terms of what's happened since uh, 2004 or five is we've been experiencing something that almost no one remarks upon except perhaps the people in this room, uh, which is that the normal retirement age, which as everyone knows is neither normal nor a retirement age, uh, has been increasing basically without any political debate and without many people noticing. So it's fascinating. This was a reform that was put in place as part of the Greenspan reforms, as I think everyone in the room probably knows. Um, that it's been occurring and ongoing without much political debate. There's, there, there are very few politicians standing up and saying we need to stop the increase in the retirement age that's occurring as we speak or as we, as we're, you know, as the world turns uh, currently. And I want to come back to that at the very end. Um, finally, before turning to a sort of more forward-looking perspective. Um, I asked Steve Goss, who did me a favor, to just kind of update uh, very briefly what the types of proposals in Diamond Orzag would do uh, to the actual imbalance today relative to what they did uh, at the time. At the time, they eliminated the actuarial imbalance. Uh, today, just given the larger underlying uh, actuarial balance the, as a starting point, uh, what Peter and I had proposed would not would no longer do the job. And part of that is just that the window has moved, um, but part of that is also a more complicated take on uh, the, the various changes that I highlighted in terms of what's shifted since then. All right, well, what about uh, looking forward? That's all hopefully uh, at least moderately interesting or maybe not uh, with regard to what's been happening over the past 15 or 20 years. Uh, what can we expect with regard to uh, forward-looking uh, Social Security projections and uncertainty? And I just wanted to highlight a couple quick points. Um, the first is just the huge impact that uh, life expectancy itself has on the actual balance and how much, how hard it is to predict the changes in mortality rates going forward. So on the left, we just show uh, a series of different, um, you know, somewhat plausible assumptions, maybe flat is a little aggressive on uh, the downside, but uh, picking between the low cost and the pre, which is basically in line with the pre-COVID uh, trend versus the high cost is I think a, a very, very difficult task. And the point here is just that the variation across somewhat reasonable different assumptions has a massive impact on uh, the projected actuarial imbalance over the next 75 years, and especially in the 75th year, which is what we show uh, on the right side there um, by two, three, four uh, points or more as you vary across these somewhat plausible scenarios. Um, I'll come back to this point uh, later, maybe during the Q&A, but it's worth pausing and thinking about how we should reflect this underlying uncertainty in the uh, forward-looking mortality rates in any social security design. 
the other thing that I think is worth uh, just highlighting briefly is this debate about whether um, COVID uh, had COVID will um, change the mortality rate projections going forward, because in a sense, the people that were you know most at risk and that unfortunately may have suffered from COVID-related mortality were the most frail parts of the society. And so going forward, you've got a different distribution of people and therefore maybe a different uh, life ex expectancy trajectory. The only problem with that, and I know these numbers may be hard to read, is it does appear to be the case that uh, mortality rates over the past couple of years were exceptionally high, not just because of COVID, but also because of non-COVID related uh, causes. I will immediately admit that it's very hard to separate what's COVID related and what's uh, not COVID related. Um, although there are a variety of categories that um, you know seem more removed from uh, COVID causes and that still saw fairly significant um, increases in mortality rates relative to uh, the situation say in 2019 before COVID hit. So I think we need to be cautious about um, concluding that uh, the mortality experience uh, going forward will be fundamentally different because uh, COVID happened and the distribution of people that survived is different than the distribution of people that were alive before COVID hit, uh, underscoring to some degree uh, the point about ambiguity in the mortality rate going forward. The impact of uh, fertility rates is also, I think, well appreciated, but it is just stunning to look at what a big impact they have. Again, I don't think that anyone can confidently predict whether we're going to sort of flatline. I guess it's even possible we'll continue to experience declines in fertility rates. Um, uh, but the variation here on the assumptions on the left between some recovery in fertility rates versus going sideways, and then on the right, the impact, very large impact on the 75th year actuarial imbalance, uh, again, highlights how little we know about how the next 75 years uh, will play out. One thing I would highlight on the fertility rate uh, is not only the excellent work that Melissa Kearney and others have done about the decline in fertility rates within the United States, but a growing global concern, including frankly, in areas of high fertility like in Africa, about how precipitous or, or rapid the declines have been over the past few years and how that will affect the global situation, which is obviously um, only you know, uh, indirectly related to uh, the topic de jour of social security projections. But I think the context of pretty rapidly declining fertility rates across the globe is, is stunning. So not too surprising, I think you're all familiar with just how wide the bands of uncertainty are uh, around these projections going forward. We just wanted to highlight that with uh, you know, a 95% or so or 97% uh, confidence interval varying between uh, you know, by, by 10, 15, 20 points of taxable payroll in the 75th year, which is a reflection of some of the factors that I was highlighting before. I wanna make sure I get time for questions. So I'm gonna just move quickly to uh, two other quick topics. Uh, one is just, um, I know this is about Social Security, apologies, but it is really important to talk for a moment about um, our other major entitlement programs, especially Medicare. And here, frankly, the news is pretty good. Um, this is a, I think, stunning chart that the Congressional Budget Office just put out about maybe a month ago in a letter to Senator Whitehouse, highlighting how their projections have changed from um, right, right around, right before the um, Affordable Care Act uh, was implemented to today. So that decrease in 2030 or 2033 of about a point and a half of GDP is just massive, far larger than what uh, traditional reforms of any type on uh, the fiscal trajectory could hope to accomplish. And I think there is an important takeaway here, which is uh, at the time, um, most people thought that the Affordable Care Act might quote, solve coverage or do a lot on coverage, but do nothing on cost. There's a debate about what's caused this um, the, the, this delta, but I strongly believe, and I, I'm very active in the field of 
uh, healthcare and healthcare services even today from a business perspective, that a lot of what happened here was the changes that were implemented as part of the Affordable Care Act. And the point there is that a lot of our budget discussions and entitlement reform uh, discussions are very narrowly focused on moving this one parameter or that one parameter because that's what the actuaries or that's what the Congressional Budget Office can score and evaluate. Whereas uh, a lot of times changing a whole variety of different structural features changes behavior in a way that produces bigger results than the narrow um, uh, provisions that are easier to evaluate and easier to score. I'm gonna skip uh, the next slide, which I'm happy to talk about in Q&A, which has to do with uh, health risk scores, and just go to maybe a, a few suggestions for how to move forward from here. Um, the first, which I hope comes across from uh, a lot of the uh, prior points I was making, is a huge degree of humility that we should have about how the world will unfold. I think in a lot of these discussions, including in budget and social security reform discussions, there's this false precision of, you know, it will be 1.8% or it will be 1.2 or it will be whatever. And I think we just need to realize that uh, there is a ton of false precision that happens uh, in those kinds of discussions. The second is that that's not sort of a nihilistic or there's nothing we can do in response to that. I would argue that what we want to do is uh, try to make our programs and the overall fiscal stance respond more automatically to the underlying drivers of that uncertainty so that we put less emphasis on nailing it ex ante and allow the system to evolve ex post uh, in a kind of organic way. A good example would be to talk for a moment about the life expectancy uncertainty that I mentioned before. And there is a philosophical question involved in social security. Um, I think it is a reasonable position to take, it's the position that I embrace, that the annuitization feature of social security is not intended to protect, well, let me say what it is intended to protect first and then go to what it's not. It is intended to protect individuals within a cohort from outliving uh, what was reasonable at the time of their retirement to expect in terms of their actual life uh, experience. Or in other words, it is intended to protect an individual from outliving uh, peers in their cohort. The way it's currently designed though, it protects not only against that, but it also insulates entire cohorts and loads the implicit cost at least on somewhere else, either on the overall budget or on taxpayers with regard to changes in life expectancy at the cohort level um, over time. And it's that part where I think we can build in more automaticity so that the, basically the net present value of lifetime, of lifetime benefits is held roughly constant. And as life expectancy changes, if life expectancy goes up, the annual benefit goes down uh, in response to that. And maybe that's something we can talk about. Next point is, is gradualism. So the slide I put up about the normal retirement age increase, I think is stunning by its, it's the dog that didn't bark, the lack of political debate that's happening as the normal retirement age goes up as we speak. And I think the reason is that it was done far in advance and most importantly, and unlike the, say the expiring tax provisions that get debated, when you have a very steep cliff, that drives attention and that drives political intervention and legislative intervention. Something that's done extremely gradually, uh, people tend not to notice. And I think that's the biggest explanation for why this is again, the dog that didn't uh, bark. And then the final point before I open it up uh, to the discussion part is that I think there are a whole variety of things that we can think about with regard to structural changes and not just programmatic ones. This comes back to my brief, uh, mention of uh, Medicare and what's happened there in particular, so that discussions about long-term fiscal imbalance and even uh, topics like Social Security should go beyond just the traditional um, parameters or the traditional interventions that everyone talks about and think more broadly. So the obvious example here is with regard to Social Security, um, other changes in society and other changes in um, other programs that could encourage longer uh, work lives 
um, could have an effect on uh, the overall program. Another obvious example is changes in immigration policy, but perhaps I'll just leave it there. And I uh, am really looking forward to the Q&A. Again, I'm sorry I could not be there with you in person, but I'm delighted to, um, to, to be part of this conference nonetheless. All right, thank you so much for those remarks, Peter. Um, and you know, it's a little lonely on the stage up here, but uh, we'll make it work. So um, sometimes I think of social security as almost a defined benefit and a defined contribution system in that the benefit structure is defined by law. The tax structure is also defined by law. And uh, this is what gives rise to a lot of the uncertainties that you spoke about um, in your remarks. Um, in, in terms of the cost and the income rate, and it's only by chance that sometimes those are gonna equal out. Well, of course, someone has to bear the risk of changes in assumptions, so be it mortality improvements or changes in fertility. And so rather than framing reform as, you know, what should be in the form of benefit cuts and what should be in the form of tax increases, you could also think about it as who should bear the risk that things don't play out as we expected. So it could be taxpayers, it could be beneficiaries, it could be future workers. And I'd be curious to hear about where you come out on that question, because I think your automaticity idea could work differently. Um, you know, is it when you get to retirement, your benefits are adjusted you know, at that point, or are taxes the thing that's being adjusted? Sure, so um, let, me, let me actually talk about the way uh, Peter Diamond and I approach that question, because I do think it's a, it's a fantastic question. And what it really gets to is you can think of two different objectives here. One is, what are the provisions that almost an expected value eliminate the actuarial balance? And then what is the way to provide assurance that we don't um, get out of whack again in the future? And before I get to the source of uncertainty, one of the obvious points that is just worth re-emphasizing here is uh, to start with, even before you get to the source of uncertainty, you have to eliminate not just the 75th, 75 year actuarial imbalance, but also the 75th year actuarial imbalance. Um, or else you're going to, as you move through time, which is exactly what happened following the Greenspan Commission, you're going to have a new hole open up. So I, that may be an obvious point, but it is worth emphasizing. Now, with regard to the underlying drivers of um, uncertainty, let me highlight two um, and, uh, and, and then talk about uh, the ways that Peter and I at least uh, thought about them. One is... Uh, the evolution in life expectancy, including by income, so uh, that growing gap in life expectancy, which uh, if anyone can predict with certainty what that gap will be in 2070, that would be a remarkable feat. Um, and second is the evolution of income inequality, and, and in particular, what share of uh, payroll is above the maximum taxable earnings level and therefore is, goes untaxed, um, which also affects the, the system's finances. Um, so what we uh, suggested with regard to the first point, and this comes back to, I guess, the philosophical point I was making about what the, what underlying objective are you trying to accomplish with the implicit annuitization within Social Security, is to uh, adjust at, at retirement. So you, know, you will know your annual benefit or your monthly benefit at retirement, and you're therefore protected going forward with regard to your, your own mortality experience. But basically, at retirement, to adjust uh, the benefit levels, and we can go through the technical way in which we did that, but the monthly benefit level, um, differentiated by average index monthly earnings in terms of um, you know, effectively your lifetime earnings, uh, for the changes in mortality that has, have occurred year to year. So in other words, if life expectancy went up uh, substantially over a 10-year period, the monthly benefits would be adjusted to offset the net present value impact of that, but to do so in a way that varied across average index monthly earnings uh, to reflect the mortality changes that have occurred 
uh, distributionally too, and not just the average. Um, with regard to um, changes uh, in income inequality, there are a whole variety of different ways of trying to index the system uh, to that, but maybe the easiest thing to do is to just allow the maximum taxable earnings level to evolve in order to hit a certain uh, share of taxable uh, share of total payroll that's taxable. So rather than setting the dollar level and then letting more dollars uh, exceed the level as income inequality goes up, you could instead say our goal is that 90% or whatever, make up your number, X percent of taxable payroll uh, will actually be taxed and we're going to adjust the maximum taxable earnings level to hit that, hit that uh, objective. Um, these are obviously value judgments in terms of where where uh, the adjustments should occur, but I guess what I would highlight is I think it's better to uh, have that debate and design a structure that actually adjusts endogenously uh, in the future to whatever actually happens rather than thinking that we can kind of fix the, the system and then be done. And that may get to the politics of the situation, which is there, there are very few windows in which we have uh, the political consensus to do anything. So when you do it, you wanna really fix it, not do it to kind of, you know, just meet the actual imbalance at that moment, because it's so rare. I mean, it may be once every 30 years that we, or 40 years that we have the chance to actually do a pension reform. Um, same thing, by the way, an aside, and then I'll stop on this, but same thing on uh, uh, fiscal support during downturns. Every single time, it becomes inconvenient to try to boost the automatic st stabilizers. Oh, no, we can't do it now. We're in an emergency. Oh, no, blah, blah, blah. Every single time, we miss the opportunity to, to build more automaticity into that part of the budget by strengthening the automatic stabilizers, which is what you actually want to do. And so there's a parallel here in terms of with higher polarization in the political system, when you have your moment, which is gonna be very rare, use it as well as possible, which means, uh, I think, again, more automaticity. I, I'm glad you brought up the parallel between kind of automatic stabilizers in terms of, in, in times of downturns, because it has a lot of parallels. And I think so many economists feel like that is just a no-brainer and would similarly agree with your proposals on social security. And yet we, you know, it doesn't seem like that's the way that policy is moving. So can you speak a little bit to the politics of this idea, like how to get people around um, something like automaticity in this context and, and how that may have changed since you first came up with these ideas with Peter Diamond? Well, look, since, uh, you know, over the past 30 or 40 years, uh, it's pretty clear that the system has become more polarized. Um, I was just remarking to someone that at my, uh, at my confirmation hearing for, to become OMB director, um, Paul Ryan introduced me, which, you know, would never happen today. And I also got a unanimous vote, which I'm pretty sure wouldn't, well, it wouldn't happen for me personally, but I don't think it would happen uh, for anyone uh, today. It probably wouldn't have happened for me personally, even back then at that uh but um, uh, it's just a completely different environment. And so I think the takeaway from that is, um, let's turn back to automatic stabilizers for a second because it might be more timely. Uh, when, you, when you have the opportunity, whatever your party is, um, it's gonna be very rare to have the trifecta of the White House, the House, and the Senate in today's environment. And if you don't have that, it's gonna be very hard to legislate. But in those periods of time, when there's an alignment, White House, House, and Senate with sufficient majorities to do anything, um, you want to really look to the long term and not just solve the immediate problem. So the reason automatic stabilizers are never included in a stimulus package is that you, you feel like you've got a fixed budget for what you're going to do, and you don't want to spend any of it on things that are not kind of just immediate. Like you don't want to buy the insurance. Maybe that's the way of putting it. Buying insurance is always, uh, it doesn't seem like you need it at the time because uh, you really, you know, you got to fix the immediate problem. And time after time after time, that's a mistake. So the takeaway is I can't predict when the, 
you know, when the Overton moment window will will reopen for any of this stuff. But when it does, take freaking advantage of it and actually do something that is uh, doesn't just fix the immediate problem, but that is structurally able to adjust to uh, future conditions. Because it may very well happen that five years after, ten years after, two years after, you wish you had done that and. Uh, and if you don't, it's it's a mistake. So that I, I think that's one clear takeaway. I'll just ask one more question, then I'll turn it over to the audience. But um, you know, you talked a lot about the uncertainty in terms of the costs of the program. Um, there's also, I, I think, program uncertainty for workers and near right retirees today as they think about how to make claiming decisions, working decisions not knowing how the program might change in the next 10 years. And what are the costs of that uncertainty? So, you know, you hear anecdotally sometimes people um, thinking they should claim now because, you know, the program might change, so I better get my benefits early. That's one type of cost that that could impose. But are there others? Yeah, yeah I hear that too. I, I um... I, I always want to sit down with those folks and just kind of say, I, you know, there are many risks in life. The thought that there would be, uh, for either current or near retirees, a material immediate benefit cut just strikes me as like so far down the list of risks that I wouldn't be basing decisions on that. I think the risk instead is uh, actually, ironically, to the rest of the budget, if you will, or the rest of the fiscal stance because in the political pecking order that uh, current and near retirees are so high up the list that the adjustment is disproportionately likely to come from something else uh, and not that. So uh, it may well be affecting individual behavior to some degree. I, uh, I think to the extent it is, it's probably um, mostly irrational. Um, and that the real risk here, the real risk from not locking these some of these parameters down is the ambiguity that it imposes for less politically protected parts of uh, the federal budget. Great. Um, I'd love to take questions from the audience if there are some. So I'm sure there are. Yeah, right here. Hi, Peter. Uh, Thank you for coming. This is Mark. I don't know if you. I don't know what you can see on your screen. I but, can't uh, see you, but I can hear you. Okay, great. Well, great to have you here, and uh, thanks for making time to be with us today. So, I guess one thing that I just wanted to ask about is your sense of the plausibility that when 2031, 32, 33 rolls around, really nothing has happened, and basically the political winds are such that doing anything along the lines of the 83 amendments, whether it's gradual or immediate or anything else, is just not possible. And the program then is financed out of general revenues, as much of Medicare is, as you know. Um, so, and is there anything that the research community can or should be doing to try to energize people to not just take what you could say is an easy way out, uh, but maybe maybe that's not what your what your take is on that. Uh, so look, I think um, we're going to see well before twenty thirty uh, kind of early indicators of whether uh, how how the political system in a highly polarized environment responds to looming deadlines. Um, there's one approaching in depending on exactly how tax receipts turn out June July of this year involving the the debt limit. Um, so those sorts of forcing events, as you know, have been what drove the political process in in the past. And I think uh, it's fair to say that without the looming threat, uh, I mean, there's always this debate of what does the trust fund mean? And uh, probably the only thing it means is that when, it, when the trust fund's nearing exhaustion, uh, as illustrated by the Greenspan Commission, it does drive, it is an impetus for action. Um, but though th that that was uh, all in a somewhat different era, and I think the um, 
the fragility around the debt limit is a good example of these forcing events may play out in different ways in the future than they have in the past. So uh, I think the only part of uh, the scenario that is likely is that as we get closer to 2030 or 2031 or 2032, the, the trust fund exhaustion date will obviously be approaching uh, to a much, uh, you know, in a, in a much more near term uh, perspective, because I think the odds of reform in the meanwhile are ex exceedingly low. Um, how that plays out, though, Mark, I, I really don't have a great feel for, because uh, we are living in a different era. The, most of the political deals that were done in the past, including the Greenspan Commission, involved the thick middle of the political spectrum uh, in Congress. And that middle is very, very thin today. So, um, you know, how you get uh, super majorities or even, you know, uh, bipartisanship in uh, favor of any Social Security reform, even when the trust fund date is approaching, I don't know. And then that ra raises, you know, the immediate question that you went to about whether we just funded out of general revenue. Um, I guess what I would say is I think uh, the system is likely to come under enormous strain before then. Uh, the debt limit will, is is one example. And so we'll, uh, I can't answer the question without knowing kind of what happens in the meanwhile um, to pick up the pieces that may happen as these sort of traditional norms get um, weaker and weaker. And then your final part is the research community. I think, frankly, um, there's not much more that can be done to underscore that there is an imbalance in Social Security and that the solution set uh, is pretty well known. So I don't really think it's on the research community at this point to be doing much more than what it's already been, been doing. Um, this is fundamentally a sort of political polarization question and the difficulty of dealing with problems ahead of time, which uh, you know was always the case, but it's exacerbated by the polarization uh, point. And unfortunately, I don't think the research community has much influence over the trend in political polarization. I think we might have only time for one more question from the audience. I have more here if you if you don't. So, I well, I, I wondered, uh, Peter, if you could tell us a little bit about um, how your experience scoring proposals as director of the CBO influenced your thinking about um, cost estimates for reform, particularly in this context. So, I would say most of my time at. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office was not really focused on Social Security. There was a lot of work on health care reform and how the Congressional Budget Office would assess uh, those, you know, a variety of reform proposals. And I guess that brings me back for a second to the chart about how much the Medicare expenditures and federal health expenditures as a share of GDP have declined relative to the projections from uh, 2010. Um, a lot of that was very, very difficult, for, or a lot of a, a lot of different provisions were very difficult for the Congressional Budget Office to evaluate. And let me spend one minute on what I think has actually happened, because that's informative to your question. I think what's actually happened here is that not no one single provision, and this is why it's hard to score. No one single provision changed the mentality of insurance companies and providers towards a bit more value orientation instead of just volume. But the combination of lots of different things and a lot of rhetoric shifted the mindset and convinced people that fee-for-service was going to die and on its way out, which then in turn shifted, uh, created a whole set of new behaviors. That combined with uh, the information technology backbone, so uh, electronic medical records, which I want to make clear in and of themselves don't reduce costs, but facilitate a whole variety of new analytics that, um, so they, they facilitate changes that may lead to different cost trajectories as opposed to doing it uh, directly. And these are all structural changes. You can't point to one single thing and say that was you know 0.25% of GDP. Um, 
so maybe that's the, the biggest takeaway I had, which is when I was at CBO, I, I probably believed a little too much in the 10 year budget window and the precision of, you know, sorry, you didn't quite make it. It's, you know, you're off by 0.12. And since then, um, while I know that there has to be a set of rules that we keep score by, um, I've just grown a bit more skeptical about that about that level of pre precision. And in particular, focus more on things that may be outside the scope of the traditional uh, reform provisions, but that could ultimately have much, much larger effects than whatever's in the, in the menu of options that are being described. With that, we will end our session, and but we are moving directly into the next one. So, but let's thank Peter for um, being with us. <laughs> <laughs>